The last couple things I'm going to walk you through in this chapter have to do with imbalances associated with bone. So the first one that's listed up here are fractures. Fractures are basically breaks in the bone. And we classify fractures four different ways. One way is the position of the ends of the bone after it's been broken. So we have displaced and non-displaced fractures. A displaced fracture is when the bone breaks and the ends of the bone are out of normal alignment. So my son came home the other day from school and said, Mary Catherine fell off the monkey bars and that her wrist looked really funny after she fell off the monkey bars. And so he said she had to go to the hospital um, and then the next day when he came home, he said she was in a cast. Well, if her wrist looked really funny after she fell, it was probably a displaced fracture, right? The ends of those bones were out of alignment, okay? A non-displaced means that it's broken, but there's, the bone is still aligned together. The other way we classify it is based on the completeness of the break. If it breaks all the way through, it's a complete break. If it just goes part of the way through the bone, it's incomplete. The orientation of the break to the long axis. So a linear fracture is when it's parallel to the long axis, so it runs in the same direction as the long axis. So you might have like a hairline fracture like running down the humerus. Transverse fracture would be perpendicular. So it'd be like if you took a bone and tried to crack it in half, okay, that would be more of a transverse fracture. And then whether the ends of the bone penetrate the skin. A compound fracture, the ends of the bone are sticking out through the skin. I remember as a kid, my back neighbor, Bradley Bonds, had this really awesome play set and fell off of it. And there, it was a bloody mess. It was really gross. And his bones were sticking out through his skin. He had a compound fracture when he fell. Okay. Compound fractures are also going to be displaced fractures. A simple fracture, a closed fracture, the ends don't penetrate the skin. So here are a couple of very specific types of fractures. So the first one that you can see over here on the left, it's called a comminuted fracture. You can see in this break, you are looking down at the bottom of the leg, just above the ankle. You can see in the tibia and fibula, those bones have broken into several pieces. That is indicative of a comminuted fracture. It's not one clean break, there's multiple pieces. Very common in elderly individuals who have more fragile bones. If their bones break, it's not typically a clean break, it's a comminuted fracture. The one on the right, this is a compression fracture. You can also see that that bone is broken into multiple pieces, but I want you to pay attention to that term compression. When I think of the word compression, I think of force, right? You're pushing on something. In a compression fracture, this is the bone's gonna break in multiple pieces and it's usually due to a traumatic accident, a fall from an extreme height, a car accident, the bone is crushed into multiple pieces. The one over here on the left is a spiral fracture. Um, these are really common sports injuries. This is when the bone breaks while it's being twisted. So these are really common in like soccer or football, any kind of tackling sport where if a player is turning at the same time that they're getting taken down or tackled, then that bone has twisting force while it's breaking and it's that's a spiral fracture. Um, I have a had a spiral fracture in my right index finger as a kid. Um, I used to coach swim team and was a lifeguard when I was younger. And it was the last day the pool was open and I got in the water and I had a squirt gun, which is stupid because you're already wet in the water, but I had a squirt gun. And this kid came up in front of me and grabbed the end of it and tried to pull it out of my hand. And he couldn't get it out, so I was holding really tight. So a kid came up behind me and dumped me and while I was underwater. The kid took that barrel of the gun and started twisting it. And I let go, but you know, the trigger guard kind of loops around your finger and I couldn't pull my hand out and he twisted and my finger was stuck in there and it twisted my finger all the way around. And I'll tell you the worst part about it is that I was underwater when it happened. 
But guess what? I heard my phone break. Like I heard it go crack, 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 crack underwater. Um, and so when I came up from the water, this finger was laying back here. So this knuckle was broken and my finger was twisted to the side. So that broke both knuckles. It was broken in nine places. And I had to have a plastic surgeon put my finger back together. I have like four pins and screws in this finger holding all those bones together. Just like, that's like the only plastic surgery I've ever had. So I'm really proud of that. <laughs> That's my spiral fracture story. An epiphyseal fracture. I'm having trouble hearing you. I doubt that. <laughs> An epiphyseal fracture is a break in the epiphyseal line, a break in the growth plate. This is the one I told you that uh, we were a little worried my son might have. Um, this is really common when kids are going through growth spurt. And the reason for that is that when you're going through a growth spurt, the cartilage is really big in your growth plate and cartilage isn't as strong as bone. So if you put too much force on your bone, the easiest place for it to break is where it will break. So if your growth plate is really thick, it's much easier for you to break it at that point than somewhere else. So really common when kids are going for growth spurts. The problem with an epiphyseal fracture, is that if you break your growth plate, does cartilage have a blood supply? Yeah, no. So guess what? takes a lot longer for a epiphyseal fracture to heal than a fracture through the bone. The bone has a great blood supply. A depressed fracture. Um, this is where a, the bone is pushed inward. Very common type of skull fracture. These are incredibly dangerous because they put pressure on that soft nervous tissue. And then the last one, I mentioned this to you on Monday, is a green stick fracture. Very common in children. It is an incomplete break. So you can see here, the break doesn't go all the way through the bone. And it is when the bone breaks just a little bit. And the reason is because, remember, kids have more of the organic matrix in their bone and a lot less of the hydroxyapatite, so less calcium. That's going to make their bones much more flexible than in adults. So green stick fractures get their name because if you're out in the woods and you pick up a green twig and you try to break it, it doesn't usually break all the way through. Okay, so very common in little kids who have softer bones. Now, if you do break a bone, how is it treated? Um, it's usually casted. Uh, it is immobilized. So the first thing that has to happen is something called reduction. This means that they have to realign the broken ends of the bone. Um, and they have closed reductions, which basically they can just manipulate the bone using an x-ray. They can kind of move them around and get them so that they're nice and in alignment and then put you in a cast. An open reduction is where they have to cut you open and they usually have to realign it surgically with pins and screws. So like in my finger, I have a big scar down my finger. I had to have an open reduction. And then it's immobilized. So whether you had a closed or an open reduction, it's immobilized, depending on the bone, um, it could be four to six weeks for bones that are small or for children or young adults. The bigger the bone, the longer you are in a cast. The older you are, the longer you are in a cast. So what happens after you break a bone? How, what is the process of that bone healing and getting fixed? So there's four stages in bone repair. The first one is a hematoma forms. What's a hematoma? Yeah, it's a bruise, right? A blood clot. Next is a fibrocartilaginous callus. This is basically like a scab inside the body. It has lots of blood vessels in it. Then you form a bony callus. So you lay down some bone and then your bone will remodel. So let's go through each of these. Okay, we're gonna start with hematoma. 
So the minute your bone breaks, all the blood vessels in your bone have also gonna be broken. They'll be torn. So you're gonna be hemorrhaging in that area. So this is why immediately when a bone breaks, it hurts, the area gets swollen. It is usually red in color and it's hot to the touch. And that's because you are bleeding into that area. You have a lot of hot blood rushing into that area and that's why it's swollen. You'll end up with that hematoma, so a big mass of clotted blood. This is also why a lot of times afterwards it'll start to bruise, um, it'll turn black and blue, and it'll be swollen and it'll be painful. The next thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna start to form this fibrocartilaginous callus. So a callus is basically what we call granulation tissue. We talked about this when we talked about skin. Granulation tissue on the surface of your body would be what we think of when we think of a scab, right? If you cut your skin, you form granulation tissue on top. It's like your body's temporary band-aid. Granulation tissue, when it's on the surface of your body and exposed to the air, it's really like, um, it's hard, right? When it's inside the body, like if it's internal, it's gonna be much softer. And so that's why we call it a soft callus. Okay, so it's a scab, it's just inside the body, not exposed to the air. When you think of a scab, what happens if you have a scab on your skin and you pick it? It's going to bleed, right? So granulation tissue has a ton of capillaries in it. And so the capillaries are helping to bring blood, including things like white blood cells, which will help to clean up the area. They clean up any like leftover debris that might be in the area where you've broken your bone. You'll have osteoblasts helping to start build the bone and fibroblasts, remember fibroblasts are found in connective tissue proper. Fibroblasts help to make collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are stronger than steel. So the collagen fibers get laid down between the broken bone ends and they act almost like stitches. They help to pull the ends of that bone together. And the osteoblasts are going to start laying down spongy bone. And eventually you'll form a bony callus. So you can see that spongy bone's been laid down. The bony callus will start to form around three to four weeks after the injury. And it's gonna keep going. Even after the cast has been removed, osteoblasts will keep forming that bony callus for about two to three months. Problem is when you break a bone, your body goes into hyperdrive to fix it. So yeah, you're gonna form a bony callus, all right? And it's gonna be way bigger than you need it to be. So where you broke that bone, the bone is gonna be much thicker than it was before. So the very last step of bone remodeling is to help shave off some of that extra bone that you laid down, because you probably laid down more than you needed. Um, so you can see in this picture right here, this is where that fracture healed, and you can see it's thicker than the surrounding bone. So the last step of bone remodeling is to kind of shave it down and get it back to the right side. The last couple of imbalances that I wanna walk you through affect the bones. They're not broken bones, but they are some imbalances that affect bone growth or development. One of them is called osteomalacia, which is soft bones. This is anytime the bones are not mineralized enough. And remember the mineral in our bone is calcium. So basically, anytime you don't have enough calcium in your bones, your bones are going to be soft. They're going to be weaker. So the main symptom of osteomalacia is when you put weight on weight-bearing bones like the legs, it's going to be painful. Um, a lot of times the legs will bow out a little bit. This is typically caused by an insufficiency of calcium or an insufficiency of vitamin D. Because remember, you can't absorb calcium without vitamin D. So like I take a calcium supplement and it says on the supplement, calcium. But if you look at the ingredient, that is calcium and vitamin D, right? So anytime you take a calcium supplement, 
you'll see there's vitamin D in there as well, so you can absorb it. Now, osteomalacia is what we call it when we see it in adults. So I guess I should go back here. Um, in the United States, we have a lot of um, social programs that ensure that people do not go hungry. So we have a lot of social programs that make sure that people are getting food. Okay? Um, so there are cases where we can see in the United States, people have osteomalacia. Where we see it the most, and this one's gonna sound really weird, is we see it in women who have just had a baby who are nursing that baby. It is not uncommon after a woman's had a baby and they're nursing, that they're not eating enough, they're not sleeping enough, they're not getting enough calcium and vitamin D, and their body is putting a tremendous amount of their own calcium and vitamin D into breast milk. And so women who are nursing, if you, try, if you plan on having a baby, make sure that you're getting a good, keep taking your prenatal vitamin after you've had your baby or take a good multivitamin so you don't develop something like this. The other thing that we'll see is that if a woman is nursing and she is deficient in calcium or vitamin D, then her baby will also be deficient in calcium and vitamin D. And when we see a deficiency in babies and children, it's called rickets. So in, in uh, children, it's the same thing. The bones are inadequately mineralized. They don't have enough calcium. We just give it a different name when it's in children. Problem with children is they're still growing. So it really affects their growth plates. We see it the most in their legs, like bowed legs is really common. We see it in places like the skull and the rib cage as well. Um, and again, we don't see this much in the United States, but where we do see it in kids is kids who um, have moms who are deficient in vitamin D who are breastfeeding can pass that on to their children. Um, and so in fact, there is, if you nurse your baby, I didn't even know this until I nursed my son. When you nurse your baby, you're supposed to give your baby these polyvisol drops. They're these red drops, they're disgusting, they smell terrible but you're supposed to put these little drops in their mouth, which are basically vitamin D drops. Um, so yeah. Um, we do see some isolated cases in the US. Uh, this is something we see more often in developing countries. So how is this fixed? Calcium and vitamin D. Um, in fact, if they give kids who have rickets, if they give them doses of calcium and vitamin D, the deformities, they'll essentially grow out of those deformities over time. That's how it's cured and treated. Um, another imbalance, which I'm sure you have heard of, is osteoporosis. This is a bone disease where bone resorption and breakdown, you are breaking your bone down, outpaces bone deposition. So you break it down faster than you lay it down. Spongy bone of the spine is the most vulnerable to osteoporosis, and it most often occurs in women who have gone through menopause. We say postmenopausal women. This has a lot to do with estrogen. Um, estrogen has a lot of um, benefits to helping us maintain our bone density. But once you've gone through menopause, you no longer release estrogen anymore. So you lose all those protective effects. And so at that point, this is when osteoporosis for women is much more common. It can cause the bones to become so fragile that if you step off a curb the wrong way, I feel like I do that all the time. You know, if you don't know there's like a step and you do a weird thing that, you can break a bone, you can fracture a bone doing that. Um, if you sneeze or cough too hard, you can fracture ribs. Um, we have a family friend with osteoporosis and she went to bed one night totally fine and woke up with a fractured back. Her vertebrae was fractured. And she's like, I didn't fall out of bed. I don't know what happened. I guess I moved funny while I was sleeping. Crazy. So what's the treatment for osteoporosis? Um, in reality, you need to get enough calcium while your bones are still increasing in density, which ladies, that is before you hit menopause. So if you're not, like all the ladies in here, if you're not taking a calcium supplement every day, you should be, you should start. Get a calcium supplement so you can increase your bone density. Um, once you've gone through osteoporosis, you can take those supplements, but it really doesn't help that much. Um, Weight-bearing exercise can be beneficial. This goes back to uh, bone remodeling. 
Remember, your bones will remodel based on the force and the demand that you place on them. So I remember growing up, when I grew up in the 80s, like moms did not work out. Like my mom maybe did Richard Simmons like twice. You probably don't even know who Richard Simmons is. Um, but it was not a thing. Like jazzercise, maybe. There were no like gyms that people would go to. Moms just did not work out. That was not a thing. Um, and now you see a lot of women as they're getting older, they're working out. It's much more of a thing. And it's not just doing cardio activities. And I try to tell my mom who's in her 70s, you have got to do some weight bearing exercise. Because remember, your bones will remodel based on the demands that you place on them. So it's not about like getting big bulky muscles. It is just about putting some force on your bones so that your bones can stay strong, okay? You can have hormone replacement therapy after you've gone through menopause. They can give you estrogen because remember, after menopause, you no longer make estrogen, which has a lot of protective benefits to making your bones strong. Um, after menopause, you're not making estrogen, so they can give you estrogen. Um, but in reality, the benefits, uh, you really lose, the, benef the risks outweigh the benefits after about five years. Um, and the reason is there are a lot of cancers that are estrogen-based cancers. Um, so your risk of cancer goes up after about five years. So they can't do it forever. You can't be on estrogen therapy for the rest of your life. You can do it for a little while. Um, there are some treatments for osteoporosis like uh, bisphosphonate. It's a once a year treatment. Um, it's an IV treatment and it has been shown to reduce bone loss by about 70% to decrease fractures by 70%. So that's pretty huge. And then also, you know, there's some physical therapy treatments where um, you might use a weighted harness or you might put weights on your ankles and on your wrists. And again, this gets back to that bone remodeling. Add a little weight onto your bones and you're going to remodel your bones and add more bone in those areas. So prevention, um, you know, I mentioned this one, get enough calcium when you're young, when your bones are increasing in density. Drink fluoridated water. Um, <clears throat> you don't want to have too much fluoride, but you know what fluoride is, right? Your dentist will do fluoride treatments. It makes your teeth, the enamel on your teeth, nice and strong and hard. Um, they actually noticed that kids that only were drinking bottled water, that weren't getting any water from like the tap, they were getting a lot more cavities. And so they've done a lot of studies and they found that it has to do with kids not getting enough fluoride. And so now, I don't know if you've ever seen them, they make little water bottles like aquapods, I think is what they're called, and they have added fluoride in them. And that's just for kids to make sure they're getting enough fluoride. There is fluoride already added to your tap water um, to make sure you get enough. So make sure that you're getting enough fluoride. In fact, my dentist asked a question, I went to the dentist the other day, and one of the questions on their sheet was, do you only drink bottled water? Um, and so I realized they're asking that because some people only drink bottled water, in which case you may not be getting enough fluoride. Fluoride makes your teeth strong, but it also helps to make the bones strong. So you do need some of that. Get plenty of exercise. And then the last one, don't drink as much caffeine. There's, this is sort of twofold. Um, the more caffeinated beverages you're drinking, the less water and milk you're drinking, right? So drink less Coke and coffee and drink more water and milk. Um, in reality though, Caffeine actually interferes with calcium absorption. So if you take a multivitamin and you drink coffee in the morning, so let's say you're drinking your coffee and you swallow your multivitamin with a swig of coffee, you might as well just open up toilet lid and dump all of your vitamins in the toilet because that's where they're going. Because caffeine is interfering with the absorption of the majority of those. Um, so I, I take multivitamins and I actually I feel like such an old lady. I have them in one of those really long pill things like days. <laughs> it might even have AM and PM. But I will fill up my little thing for the week and I bring it into work and I take my multi multivitamins at lunchtime because I drink coffee in the morning. So I don't want to take it before I leave and I don't want to take them in the evening before I go to bed. I want to have them when I'm up and moving and eating a lot. And so I try to take mine right in the middle of the day. I think this is the last imbalance 
that I'll mention is Paget's disease. Um, this is caused by, well, we don't actually know what causes it, but it is excessive bone formation and breakdown. So it causes some areas of your skeleton to get really thick and other areas to get really weak and thin. Um, usually we find it most often in the spine, the pelvis, the femur, and you can see over here the skull. Usually this doesn't occur until after about the age of 40 and they don't really know what causes it. Uh, they think that it could be genetic. Um, it could be possibly genetic and maybe turned on when you're exposed to a particular virus. They really don't know what causes this. Um, the image over here is Egil. This was a famous Viking. There are tons of stories about Egil. Um, he was a famous Viking because most Vikings died really early, like before they ever turned 20. They usually died in battle. But Egil is famous because he lived much older into his 40s. And there are stories about Egil surviving axes to the head. Um, and the reason is because Egil had Paget's disease. So his skull was incredible incredibly thick. Now, eventually Paget's disease took his life. Um, he was unable to see. Um, he lost a lot of his senses. Um, so he eventually died from this disease, but um, that is his home. 